Hey students! Today I get the opportunity to share my adventures on how I became a conservation detection dog handler. If someone asked me, what do you want to do when you bust out of high school? I never would have thought that this job was even possible. Some of you are wondering, well, what in the world is a conservation detection dog handler? Don't worry, we'll get to it. I'm going to share my field journal, something that I use to keep track of lessons, goals, and adventures of all the projects I've been on. But first, I want to share one of the most influential moments in my detection dog handling career. thinking, what? You get to take your dog on wild adventures to help save wildlife? Yep, I do. But my journey in becoming a conservation detection dog handler was not very easy, and there are many lessons to be learned while doing this work. Today, we're going to discuss a little bit about my journey, a behind-the-scenes look at how detection dogs work. I'll show you some of the lessons I've learned, and I'll share some great field footage. So meet me. My name is Susie Marlowe. First and foremost, I'm a conservation detection dog handler. Sometimes we call ourselves bounders because we bound through wild spaces and we're bound to our dogs. I helped co-found a company called Rogue Detection Teams. When I'm not in the field, I create educational content so I can talk to amazing students like you. Now, I'd like you to officially meet Skye. Her nicknames include Bing Bonk, Lightning Bug, and Monkey. Skye was rescued by the Santa Fe Humane Society, who noticed that she had a very special talent, and that talent was being absolutely obsessed with playing fetch. The volunteers at the shelter knew she needed a special home. Not many families were interested in having a fetch-obsessed dog. Her special behavior made her an ideal detection dog candidate. Since becoming a working dog, she's been a primary sidekick of mine for five years and knows about 20 different targets. We have traveled all over the U.S. and, as you saw, even overseas. I have learned so much from this little ball of joy, like how she really doesn't like my dancing and garage doors, or how she likes to crawl into sleeping bags at any temperature. One time at camp, Sky snuck into a coworker's tent and buried herself in her sleeping bag, and no one even noticed. So, how did I get... The job as a detection dog handler. Well, I to start, I studied biology at Penn State, and there I learned about how researchers capture and collar wildlife. I felt a little guilty knowing that these animals were disturbed when we studied them, but then I learned about non-invasive techniques. Scientists could use camera traps to take their animals' photos, or they'd set out hair snares to collect genetic information. But I'd never heard of dogs being used. I also joined the rock climbing club and even took a scuba diving class. I knew I wanted to study animals, but I was having a hard time knowing what kind of job I could have where I could be outdoors. I didn't know what to do. So I want you to raise your hand if you have no idea what you want to do right now. Now keep your hand raised if you're a little worried that you don't know what you want to do in the future. And for all of you without your hands raised, do you still sometimes worry about your future? Well, that's normal. 
but it's important not to worry. I wish someone told me, you don't know what you want to do. That's okay. You may get a job that doesn't even exist yet. Throughout today's talk, you're going to try and guess what decision I made next to help make my life easier, happier, and healthier. When I didn't know what I wanted to do next after college, what did I do? Did I panic? Did I apply for any job that was seemed interesting to me? Or did I call my parents and tell them life is too hard? While I didn't panic and I didn't call my parents to complain, I started applying for jobs that were interesting to me. I worked at the Grand Canyon National Park where I was able to explore a vast landscape. I worked at a rock climbing gym and realized how strong I could be. I worked as a scientific scuba diver in Hawaii looking at coral disease. I even worked at a Christmas tree farm. But soon, I felt as if I found my calling. I had an internship at Sea Turtle Inc., a rescue center in Texas that rehabilitates stranded sea turtles, patrols beaches for nesting sea turtles, and releases baby sea turtles as they hatch from their shell. It was a very fulfilling job, and I rode an ATV for 60 miles on the beach as a patroller at least twice a week. There, I fostered a dog named Deacon. I asked the shelter if they had one or a dog that had lots of energy because I did too, and they did. I took him running on the beach, biking in town, and hiking with a little backpack on. But I soon realized I loved learning how to communicate with Deacon. I taught him tricks. I showed him that he could swim out into the ocean and he didn't need to be afraid. We soon learned of a dog that lived near the sea turtle rescue center that helped patrollers find sea turtle nests. They wanted to find them so they could relocate all of the eggs to a safe location. Sometimes cars can damage the nests of these endangered animals. So from my field work in Sea Turtle Inc., I realized that I wanted to go into the field of wildlife biology which is the study of animals and their behavior in the spaces they live. I realized that I wanted to refine that field of study and focus more on conservation biology, which focuses on protecting those animals, their habitats, and ecosystems. I couldn't find a job that allowed me to bring Deacon, so not knowing much about detection dogs, I decided I would try and train him to find sea turtle eggs and I would live in Mexico. Coincidentally, I learned about a job that used dogs to find scat, which is the scientific name for poop. Up in the frozen tundra of Alberta, biologists were looking for wolf and caribou scat. Dogs were excellent at finding the brown gold. And I thought, helicopters, dogs, wildlife, snow, cool! Looks like a cool job, right? Well, I So the first lesson I learned from working with the dogs before I even worked with them is having determination. If you want something bad enough, show your worth. This was the first job I thought, OMG, I must have this. So I spent the next week working on my cover letter. I asked friends and family to edit what I had written. I asked for feedback. I rewrote my cover letter. I tirelessly conducted my own research on what conservation detection dogs did. This is what I learned. A conservation detection dog is a little bit like a nature explorer. The dogs learn what their target is, whether it's a scat, a live animal, a plant, or a virus, and it finds the target for a chance to play ball. Sometimes dogs do this work for food, but they can't do it on their own, and it takes a very special naturalist human sidekick to help navigate the team. A dog and a person make up a detection team that offers researchers a way to sniff out answers. So if a biologist wants to learn about cougar populations by analyzing, let's say, their scat, which we know is poop, a human can train a dog to find cougar scat over a large landscape. If a scientist needs to learn about salamanders, or let's say a caterpillar, 
A human can teach a dog to sniff out that animal, even hidden in logs. If a tree grower needs to learn if a tree is diseased or sick, a human can teach a dog to alert to that sick tree. So when you heard me say, Sky can investigate over 20 different targets, it means so many things. These teams survey different environments for a specific target that will help researchers answer their scientific questions. Quickly, I learned Deacon didn't have the right personality to look for scat or sea turtle nests as a job. He didn't really have that drive. So I ended up finding a Deacon a loving home and applied to work for the University of Washington. During my research, I also learned a little bit about how the dogs work. Here's Zilly. Her name is short for Godzilla because of the way she plays. She's going to be trained on Wolverine scat, which is totally a real animal and not just a comic book hero. Zilly sniffs the sample and boom, the ball appears. It's party time. Dogs do that over and over and over again until they're confident on what the human is asking them to find. Then the human starts saying, sit, as the dog smells it. Zilly is quick to learn that if she sits, when she finds a scat, then she's telling the human, hey, it's party time, throw the ball. Then this is repeated over and over and over, and well, you get it, until the dog becomes confident. So when I told people I was applying to this job, they were like, oh, what a perfect job for you, finding poop with a dog? I couldn't imagine a better fit. And I was like, seriously? I'm not sure what that means about my personality. But I continued my application process. I updated my resume. I sent in the application early. So I waited by my computer with fingers crossed, and one day the news arrived. Guess what? I didn't get the job. I was so, 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 so bummed out. So can you tell me? What should I do next? Should I cry and cry and cry and then eat ice cream? Should I offer to volunteer so they could meet me in person? Or should I call my parents and tell them that they should demand they hire me? Yep, that's right. They actually offered a volunteer opportunity where I could spend two weeks shadowing some detection teams. I brought a good attitude, only one pair of wool socks, and an eagerness to learn. And those two weeks... After they ended, I was offered the job. It was so amazing. I was actually hired as a scat collector, but I saw this as a total win. I saw animals I had never seen before. I took a snowmobile driving course, and we got to go over some jumps. And I learned about the power of the detection dog methodology. Within a month, they were impressed with my tenacity, and I was asked to be a handler for the remainder of the season with Captain. And that's where I learned how to speak dog. The second lesson I learned was to have patience. Sometimes if you put in the effort and bide your time, the option that seemed harder may eventually make your life easier. I was on a project where researchers were trying to understand the effects of parasites and diseases on moose populations. For this style of study, I had to keep my detection dog surveying in a predetermined line, also known as a transect, and it's not easy. I had my dog, Skye, who was full of energy, but I also had a new dog, Zilly. Zilly was new and very shy. Honestly, she was a bit like Velcro. She loved her ball, but she'd just stare at you and think, why would I go look for something when you have the ball hidden in your armpit? It was difficult to encourage Zilly to search on her own. Most of the dogs learned this behavior quite quickly, but she was kind of nervous. At one point, I thought, maybe maybe she can't do this job. But just like anyone starting something new, it can be hard to feel confident when you don't recognize anything. Just because I knew the routine, it didn't mean cute little Zilly did. So, can you guys guess what I did next? Did I learn how to speak dog and say, woof, woof, rough, woof, which meant, you can do this. Did I patiently repeat the training process until she felt confident? Or C, did I leave her on the bench and only work Sky? If you guys picked that I patiently repeated the process and encouraged Zilly, you're right. And soon, 
Skye wasn't the only super confident sassy detection dog. So here's a video of Skye and Zilly. And this is Skye. She's got a lot of energy. And this is Zilly. She's quite sweet. But with time, she became very confident in her own search too. And in this last scene, you can see a moose scat that she had found. So it was a very proud moment for me. And funnily enough, once Zilly found her mojo, she was so much easier to keep on a transect line than Skye. The next lesson I learned was to stay curious. Have you ever been given a task and you've done it a thousand times already? Well, don't forget, there are still many things to learn along the way. So I'd done a lot of scat searches before, but as you learn, Sky and I traveled halfway across the world looking for pangolin scat. Now that we all know what a pangolin is from the first video, right? Our job was to find their poop. The University of Washington's goal was to create a genetic map of pangolins. Using SCAT, they could pull a unique geographic ID for that animal. That way, when anti-poachers confiscated live animals, they could check that animal's genetic ID and match it from where it came from. One problem, we didn't know anything about how or where they pooped. We started this project in Nepal and on the first day, Skye sat next to a blank piece of earth near a pangolin burrow. When Skye sits, as you know, it's her alert that she found something. So what did I do next? Did I dig into the dirt? Did I B, spend more time training her since she obviously didn't know what she was looking for? Or C, scold Skye for wasting my time? Yep, I dug into the dirt, and what did I unearth? A fresh, juicy pangolin scat, and they really stink. They're actually made up of termites and ants. And that's what we learned, that pangolin often buried their poop in the wild. So in Vietnam, a lot of pangolins are no longer found in the wild. So the hunt for scat was a lot harder. And at times it kind of seemed hopeless. We scoured the jungle and I was just hoping and praying that Skye would find a scat. One day she circled under this tree, behaving as if she had found a target or was close to it. But she never really sat to tell me that she had something. If anything, she looked a little frustrated or confused. She then looped around the tree, looked at me and kind of moped off into a different direction. So what did I do? Did I A, follow Skye sullen, sullenly along on the never-ending quest to find Pangolin Scat? Did I B, curiously look inside the tree cavity that was six feet off the ground where she was searching? Or did I hug Skye and tell her that she's a good girl? Yep, B, I checked the tree and check out what happened next. Yeah, that's right. We found a curled up pangolin inside the tree she was sniffing around. This was the first time that we knew of that a dog confirmed the presence of a pangolin in the wild for conservation. While it wasn't its scat and it was very hard to pinpoint, Sky was very curious about checking out the odor and so was I and we were resulted with a beautiful treasure. 
The next lesson I learned was to be creative. In this one situation, I was really frustrated. So I identified what was frustrating. Okay, so this was my fourth project ever. I got paired with this monster of a dog. His name was Ranger, and he was 70 pounds. That's as big as most fourth graders. There was a pollution event that occurred in the 1970s, and still scientists were trying to learn how damaging the event was. They studied the tiny microscopic animals all the way up to the big ones. There was one animal, a mink, that was called the indicator species. It meant that if there aren't any mink or they're sick, then something pretty big must be wrong. So we had to find mink scats along streams because that's their favorite place to live. We crawled through marshes and thick edge habitat. Sometimes it would take an hour to travel 100 meters, which is like the length of a football field. This was Ranger's first project, and boy was he excited. When he found a scat, he would almost put his face on it, then try to lunge for the ball when I rewarded him. This was dangerous because we needed to preserve the DNA of the scat. If Ranger or I accidentally touched the scat, we would compromise the quality of the DNA, and if the lab analyzed a contaminated sample, it could come back as dog or human instead of mink. Not only that, but as Ranger would leap for the ball, it could disturb the earth and we would lose the scat because it was so small and the habitat was so dense. So, what do you think I should do? Should I teach him how to back up after he finds a scat so both he and I had more space? Should I yell at Ranger and say, you are too big and too excited for this job? Or should I pick up the scat, put it in my pocket, and analyze it later? What you got? Backed up back. a little, and back. now he's backing up back. a lot. Back, back. <laughs> hey, nice job. Yep, I taught him to back up, and then I could slowly approach him or throw him the ball from afar, and he could play with it away from that brown gold. So he helped collect data for a lawsuit that hoped to restore the damage that had occurred from the pollution event. So maybe some of you are thinking, hey, can I do this? Or maybe some of you are like, ew, scat, no thank you. For those who are thinking, I wonder if I can do this when I bust out of the third grade or the fifth grade or 11th grade, here are some things that I love to do that make me a good fit for this job. Do you love to travel? Do you love to be outside? Do you love to get muddy? Do you work hard? Do you have the desire to learn how to speak dog? then you may really enjoy this job. But even if you like to do all those things, here are some characteristics that I have learned while doing this job. Like I mentioned in a lot of the lessons, if you can learn how to be curious, be creative, be adaptable, patient, and adventurous, you'll be prepared for almost anything. If getting muddy and being outside isn't your thing, that's okay. There's still so many amazing conservation jobs that are important. And I have learned that having these qualities is a must to succeed and a really great way to stand out. I've also learned this. Our dogs have traveled all over the country and even worldwide. We have worked in so many different countries. And when we do, not only do we learn about wildlife, but we learn that the culture about dogs can be quite different. We have been so lucky for the opportunity to share with communities how amazing these super sniffer dogs can be. Finally, the biggest lesson of all is one man's trash is another man's treasure. All of these dogs at one point during their life were deemed too fetch obsessed, difficult to handle, reactive, or unsuitable for a home. Of course, none of these dogs were considered trash, but they were not dogs that families wanted to adopt. 
Because of their incessant drive, they lived at a shelter. There was one dog that when you put the ball on top of an object like a refrigerator, she would stare at it for six hours. Their desire to play fetch made them absolutely perfect for the work we do and has turned them into wildlife heroes. But do you think when Skye was living in the shelter that she thought, one day I'm going to get out of this shelter and I'm going to go to Vietnam and Nepal to search for pangolin scat? Or do you think when Pips was alone, he thought, even though I was adopted and returned six times from my shelter, it's going to be okay because one day... I'm going to get adopted and spend hours and hours getting to squish my ball to save wildlife. No, of course not. So just because you can't envision something happening to you at a moment in time doesn't mean that it won't happen. So check out some of our heroes doing the thing they do best. So to end this presentation, I want to introduce you to Pips. Again, as I mentioned, he was adopted six times at a shelter and returned six times. And he's one of our dogs that just loves to ask, you know that I love to work to play ball. If you could pick one item to work for besides money for the rest of your life, what would it be? Write it down and share it with us. We'd love to share it with our community. He also likes to share his most important message, and that is never, ever feel limited by what people say or think about you. Just because someone thinks that this dog is not suitable to be adopted does not mean they can't. So anything that you feel limited by, just know that somewhere, someone will be looking for the traits that you have. Thank you all for taking interest in the work Sky and I do. It's been so fun being able to talk to a classroom full of amazing kids, even a couple of classrooms such as yourselves. I wish Sky and I could visit you guys in person, but for now, this virtual trip will just have to do. I honestly could go on for hours, so keeping a 30-minute limit is always a challenge. If you have any questions about the work we do, don't hesitate to reach out. Talk to your teacher. We have a number of social media accounts to stay connected, to follow our adventures. And if you guys think we need the newest social media platform that's unknown to me, let me know. Maybe you could be part of the Rogue Pack too. Bye!